I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. I've been doing both for 30 years. To cook well, it helps if you love and value food, as that is where it all starts. My approach to cooking is simple and not new. Use the best ingredients you can, get organised and follow the recipe. That way, you'll be sure to get wonderful results. There are several different methods for baking fish. You can bake fillets in a foil parcel, on baking parchment or au gratin with a bubbling sauce and a golden topping. Today I'm going to bake a whole fish on the bone and this is a technique that is particularly suitable for flat fish such as plaice, turbot, brill or black sole. The resulting flesh is moist, tender and flavoursome, benefiting greatly from the skin and bone of the fish as it's cooking. To serve with it, I'm going to make a Breton sauce, somewhat similar to the classic hollandaise Easier to make, but no less delicious. I've got a lovely black sole, or Dover sole, as it's sometimes called, for this particular technique for baking a fish, a flat fish, in this way. Another day it might be a place, which would be beautiful, particularly during the summer months, or a turbot or a brill. They are all prepared and cooked in exactly the same way. And the advantage to this particular technique is you're cooking the fish on the bone and with the skin intact. So you're getting maximum flavour and it gives you a really, really beautiful texture. So I'm going to start by cutting off the head. Turn the board whatever way it feels comfortable for you. Put in my knife just behind the gills. There, there's the gills and actually just behind that little fin that sits up there like that. The head we discard. We're going to score through the tough skin, and the skin on black sole or dover sole is really, really tough. Believe it or not, there are stories of the skin of these soles being made into shoes. Go as close to the frill as you can of the fish, out towards the frill, but still cutting into the flesh. And then just cut in, and you're not just marking the flesh, you're cutting in. And then I'm going to turn the fish and do exactly the same thing on the other side, like that. And I like to run my knife just through it like that to make sure I've loosened it all the way around. Perfect, so I'm going to take that to the sink and give it a good rinse to make sure there's no trace of blood left. Now, our fish, we've cleaned perfectly, spotlessly clean, no trace of blood. So before I put it into the oven to cook, I'm just going to add a little water to the tray, about five mils, prevents the fish from sticking. pinch of salt, just along the back like that, and then into a preheated oven for about 15 to 20 minutes. It will depend on the size of the fish and the thickness of the fish. So while the fish is cooking, I can make the Breton sauce. I've put my butter just melting, and you can hear it sort of simmering, because it needs to be slightly bubbling when we're pouring it in on top of the egg yolks. And if you've ever been nervous about making a hollandaise-type sauce, this is a version of hollandaise, but easier to achieve and less sort of nerve-wracking for many cooks. So a couple of lovely free-range egg yolks, um, a little mustard. I'm using a lovely green mustard. If you can only get conventional yellow or Dijon mustard, that will actually work perfectly. So a pinch of that goes in, and then a little squeeze of lemon juice. So whisk those up a little bit. Then just start to add in the barely simmering butter, just very, very slowly, a little at a time. Don't rush away madly, because if you add the butter in too quickly, it can curdle on you. If it does curdle, get a teaspoon of water into it straight away and whisk, and that usually solves the problem. Gradually, the sauce will start to thicken up. When you get down to the last little addition of butter, and you get to notice the little salty little bits there in the bottom of the pan. You'd be inclined to think they don't look so great, but actually a lot of the flavour lies in there. So every last little bit of the melted butter and the funny bits at the bottom get whisked in. OK, now that's the consistency. Let's turn that off like that, which is sort of perfect. Now I'll decant it to keep it warm. There we go. That will sit there quite happily until the fish is ready, or even for up to a half an hour. Fish will be cooked. Let's have a look. Now, to check to see that the fish is cooked, the simplest thing to do is to check the thickest part of the fish, so up where the head has been removed from. If the flesh starts to lift away easily like that, 
quite simply, you know then it's cooked. So then just lift off the skin. Sometimes it comes away very easily, all in one piece, and sometimes it comes away in several pieces. It's not the end of the world if like that it comes away in several pieces. Okay, last little bits, losing the minimum amount of flesh. A couple of lemons on there, a sprig of an appropriate herb, lovely feathery fennel. But what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to show you how to take a fillet of fish off the bone because that also is very, very useful to know. Now, my sauce, which has been sitting, just keeping warm. You can see it's thickened up ever so slightly. So what I like to do is I'm going to add in a little cooking water. This is going to add flavour and it's going to mean that the sauce is going to end up not being too rich. Now that's the consistency I want. I'm going to add in the herbs that get that last menace green hit colour-wise and flavour-wise. Okay, perfect. So a hot plate again. So we've got a line there running down along the centre of the fish, so just cut down along that line there like that. Cut the fillet in half like that. And rather than lifting off the whole piece and it breaking up on you, just take half of the fish and then turn it just the lower side down. A little of the sauce, just enough to coat the fish. It's rich, so you don't need too much. You can do a little arty dribble if you feel like doing that. A little garnish. Little lemon wedge just to finish it off and then straight to the table. A great simple technique which completely captures the flavour of the fish because you cooked it with the skin on the bone. Should be really lovely to eat. Starline of beef on the bone is a lovely cut. Best to order from your butcher a little time in advance to give him time to put aside a piece of properly hung beef for you. Like most cuts of meat, especially the larger ones, this will sit quite happily after cooking for at least half an hour before you serve it. You can make a simple gravy, or you can pull out all of the stops and make a very grown-up sauce with red wine, tomatoes and gherkins. This is serious cooking, not difficult, but serious. And when you pull off this sauce, you should clap yourself thunderously on the back, as indeed should your guests. We're going to roast this beautiful piece of beef, sirloin of beef, on the bone, which has come from my local butcher, Middleton Frank Murphy, a lovely piece of quality assured Irish beef. Dry aged, as you can see, the fat is lovely and dry, and note the amount of fat, quite a bit of fat. You can take off some of the excess fat, cut it off, before you roast it if you want, but if you don't have a decent bit of fat on the beef to start off with, the chances are it's not going to be juicy, succulent, and full of flavor. The preparation of the beef at this point then is extremely simple. All I'm going to do is to score the fat. I'm just going in a sort of a millimetre with the blade of the knife. So just a sort of a, a crosshatch pattern like that. All it needs then is some salt and pepper. Reasonably generous amount of salt. Black pepper, again, fairly generous. No need for any oil, no need for any butter here because you've got the fat that the animal has produced itself. So. Oven preheated, quite hot to start off with, 240 degrees there, about for 15 minutes, and then we'll turn the heat down. And we're going to cook this until it's medium rare in the centre. That way you'll have a little well done at either side for somebody in the family or somebody at the table who prefers a little bit of the meat more cooked. So, you know, when you have a good bit of beef, it couldn't be easier. Great. The beef is in the oven cooking. I'm going to get the sauce on the go. Starting off by sweating off the shallots in a little bit of butter, just finely diced shallots. Okay, lid on. It's a low heat and a tightly fitting lid. So the shallots should be ready. Yeah, they are. Look at all the lovely steam coming up out of the pan. So the port and the Grand Marnier can go in, just straight in like that. And you get a lovely aroma. It's like being in a cellar, absolutely lovely. So the um, Grand Marnier and the port has reduced. We're going to add in the wine. Pour it all in in one go. And this must come back up to a simmer and again reduce down until it looks like just a red wine shallot puree in the bottom of the pan. 
Then the stock goes in. Quite a bit of chicken stock. And when you put in the chicken stock, as you see, it looks pretty alarming and looks like something which will never really be beautiful and taste beautiful. But you've got to keep the faith. Now, the beef certainly looks cooked. And see the way the fat has become lovely and crispy. You hear that lovely sort of crispy sound. So that should be delicious to eat. Now, to test that my beef is cooked, I'm just going to use a skewer and put it into the thickest part of the meat in there and count two, three, four, five. Then I take that and you can test it there if you like, or you can test it if you're a little bit nervous about the heat there. Uh, you can test between your thumb and your first finger like that. And the heat of the skewer tells you how cooked the beef is. And this is just nicely warm, so the beef should be just medium to medium rare inside. Now, so just going to put that to rest. So the sauce is pretty much ready. It's reduced down, it's starting to thicken very slightly. And all I'm going to do now is to strain out the shallots. And as you can see, you end up with not very much sauce, but it's so intense in flavour that you serve very little of it, and a little of it goes a long way. Press on the shallots to extract any extra flavour and allow the sauce to simmer for another few minutes. With the beef resting, the final thing to make is a delicious cabbage puree, absolutely magnificent enough to accompany the sirloin of beef. Also after the break, I'll show you a refreshing and tangy blood orange jelly, the ideal dessert after such a rich main course. Before the break, we left our sirloin of beef resting in the oven. Every last drop of flavour was extracted from the schlotz and the sauce left to reduce. Now it's time for something unexpectedly good, cabbage puree, or if you think it sounds better, a puree of cabbage. Making the cabbage puree is simplicity itself. Cut the cabbage in half and then into quarters and remove the hard core in the centre. Slice each quarter into fine slices against the grain. Don't throw away the dark outer leaves. There's so much flavour and goodness in these. Give it all a good rinse, just in case there is grit trapped between the leaves and add to a large pot of boiling water into which you've put a generous pinch of salt. Simmer the cabbage uncovered for about four minutes until the leaves are tender and reserve some of the cooking water. Strain the cabbage and place in a food processor. Give it a quick blitz and then add a few knobs of butter, some cream, and some of the reserved cooking water. Just experiment until you have reached the desired flavour and consistency. Season generously. This is the sort of texture I like, a little firmer than dropping consistency. The flavour is superb, fresh and vibrant. The beef is resting and is ready to carve. The cabbage puree is ready to go. I just need to finish my sauce. So the final additions to the sauce are the tomato, and the diced gherkin. And then, finally, a few little lumps of butter. When you add in the butter, you can either stir it in, like that, or else you can actually just shake the pan. And that's called actually making waves in restaurant kitchens. And it's a way of getting the butter to blend in or emulsify with the other ingredients. So it's just going to come back up to a gentle, gentle simmer. Right, the sauce is perfect. So I'm going to put a little into the sauce boat and serve it on the carving dish with the beef. Okay, so let's just carve a little of the beef. I'm just going to cut straight down. The outside slice is going to be more cooked. Another lovely slice. And note when I carve it, the juice isn't running out. It's all just sitting together in one place. It's just about enough to get us going. So a little of the cabbage puree alongside the beef. And then finally, 
a little drizzle of the sauce. Not too much of the sauce, remember it's quite rich. So a couple of spoons of that. And then a little sprig of rosemary, just because we have it there, because it will look beautiful and scent everything. And then straight to the table with that. That should be really feast-like to eat. If you've always yearned to create quivering jellies and delicate and gently set chilled mousses or souffles, there is one technique you have to master, and that is the use of gelatine. For some cooks, the sighting of the word gelatine in a recipe is enough to have them flicking over the page, as it has an unjustified reputation for being difficult. That's a pity, because when you know the rules involved, which are both few and simple, you will find that gelatine is really easy to use. And once mastered, it opens up a huge range of recipes that otherwise can't even be considered. I want to show you a jelly that will delight everyone, especially those who last had jelly when they were children. I love when the blood oranges are in season, and I tried to make this jelly recipe, particularly at that time of the year, though you can make it at any time of the year, you know, just using normal oranges. But the lovely sort of sanguine nature of the blood oranges is beautiful. So, I'm going to zest um, one of my normal oranges first. And this zesting of citrus fruit is an absolute fast track to citrus flavour. When you're doing this, you'll feel your hands getting oily, and that is the orange oil, and that's exactly what you're after. Lovely. Now, to segment the orange, what I like to do is to just cut a little strip off the top of the orange like that, just until you can see the flesh. And the same off the bottom. Then start cutting. So I'm cutting with my knife a line, just tracing a line above the white line of the pit. It's a sort of a cutting, sawing motion. Now, just in case, if there's any little bit of extra juice in there, squeeze it out, like that. Then, to remove the segments, you see we've got the little um, membranes which hold the segments in place. So cut inside the first membrane like that, and then inside the second, and you pop out a perfect segment like that. So having removed the first segment, I have a little bit of leeway, a little bit of space for movement with my knife. So then just cut in towards the middle and just sort of press like that, and it comes away really cleanly like that. When you've done this a few times and you get good at it, it's really actually quite a satisfying feeling. So that's the last segment, and then just squeeze any little bit of remaining juice out of the, the frame of the orange, if that's what you want to call it. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is add in some lemon juice. Interestingly, when you add a little bit of lemon juice, it's not going to make the jelly taste of lemon, but it just makes it taste more of orange, actually. OK, that's my lemon juice going in there. A little stock syrup, which I've measured. Stock syrup, or simple syrup. And that's going to sweeten, because the fruit needs a little bit of sweetening. I'm using a little orange liqueur, which is optional. It's a teaspoon, literally. You could leave it out if you didn't have it. OK, while that's happening, I need to um, put my gelatine on to melt, because the gelatine is what's going to hold the jelly together. And whenever you're using gelatine, be it either powdered, which I'm using, or leaf, you want to use just the amount to create a lovely wobbly jelly. This is not something we want to be able to play squash with. It wants to be just a lovely wobbly jelly. So two teaspoons of gelatine is the amount that I require. And in this bowl here, I've got two tablespoons of water. So measure in your gelatine, just rounded teaspoons like that. And then just give it a little stir. What I'm trying to avoid as much as possible is the gelatine going high up along the side of the bowl. And then we allow this to sit for a little while, and the expression is to sponge the gelatine. And in a few minutes, you can put this in the fridge if you want to, but in a few minutes, even at room temperature, this will take on a sponge-like consistency. Now I can chop my mint. I'm going to chop the mint quite finely for this particular jelly. Right, that's lovely. Finely chopped uh, like that, really nice. So add this in. You can see the way it's still lovely and green. 
So mix all that together. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to strain this because I'm not absolutely sure how much liquid I have in here and I need to be sure because I have a certain amount of gelatine for a certain amount of liquid. Strain out the liquid from the bowl of oranges and then measure out 300 mils of the liquid. It's really important to be accurate with this. So the measured juice, the uh, sweetened segments with the mint all ready to go. Now, our gelatine, now you can see it looks like a sponge. So all we do now is sit it into our bowl of barely simmering water to dissolve. So make sure the water isn't boiling. It can be a little gentle simmer around the edge, but not boiling because you can overheat it, in which case, again, it might stick to the side of the bowl and you won't get it in here, which is where we want it. So the gelatine has been dissolving and the little granules of gelatine, which looked sponge-like a few minutes ago, now have become clear. So it comes out of here. Now, one really important rule about gelatine, you never pour warm gelatine into a cold mixture. You always take some of the cold mixture, in our case the sweetened orange juice, you always pour that into the gelatine. You never pour gelatine straight in, because if you do, it can turn back into little lumps of jelly, which is not what you're trying to achieve. So our measured juice, our measured gelatine, gives a good stir. And then I like to just sort of double decant it, if you like. Great. Empty the orange segments into a bowl, add the juice and gelatine mixture, and stir it all gently together. And that's it. That's ready now to set into our little receptacles. The jellies are set. I love particularly serving them in the glasses. You can see the way the colour of the orange segments and the blood orange juice and the little flecks of mint just look so pretty. I'm going to turn out the little jelly I set in the oiled mould. For a final flourish, you can add some chopped mint to some orange juice and pour over the jelly. A little softy whipped cream is what I would like to eat with this. Perhaps a little thin, crisp biscuit, nothing else. Very light, very refreshing, lovely way to end a meal.